Stanford University. Good morning, Stanford, and welcome back to campus for Reunion Homecoming 2011. We are so very pleased that you chose to join us this weekend. So before we start, could I ask our trusted technicians in the back to please, please raise the house lights? Thank you so much. So now, bathed in the glory of this wonderful, iconic memorial auditorium, otherwise known as? Could I ask the class of 1961 to please stand? Ladies and gentlemen, in addition to being a decidedly handsome class with wonderful stories of hijinks and romance and even some academics while they were here as students, there's something else very special about this class. They are celebrating a Stanford milestone, their 50th reunion. And they came back in strength. There are nearly 400 members of the class with us here this weekend representing 35% of their class. Over the course of the last 50 years, they have been brought great honor to themselves, their families, and yes, to Stanford. So welcome, class of 1961. I hope this is everything you hope it to be this weekend. Congratulations on your 50th. All right, so, as the president of the Alumni Association, I have to tell you, we have what seems like a very simple mission, but is actually exceedingly difficult. We seek to reach, serve, and engage all Stanford alumni so as to foster lifelong intellectual and emotional connections between the university and its graduates. University to graduate, graduate to university, graduate to each other. As you might well imagine, nothing comes even close to the power of this weekend, Reunion Homecoming, and helping us to fulfill our mission. Quite simply, magical things happen when 6,000 alumni from all over the world, representing 75 years of Stanford history, descend on the farm all at the same time. This magic creates a sense of community that is truly a wonder to behold, and something, if you'll allow me, that I think Jane and Leland would be mighty proud of if they were with us here today. I hope that over the next several days, you're able to forge your own intellectual and emotional connections that bond you with your roommates and stronger with the university. It's very much why we invited you back, and we're so happy that you chose to accept our invitation. So let's get on with the show, and let me do this by sharing a little bit of a list with you for your consideration. David Starr Jordan, John Casper Branner, Ray Lyman Wilbur, J.E. Wallace Sterling. Ah, oh, so we have some Sterling fans. And oh, see, so now you're going to make the other presidents feel bad if you don't <laughs> applaud later. Oh, so we were at J.E. Wallace Sterling. So Donald Tresider. Ket we all, he was only here for four years, but still. <laughs> Kenneth Pitzer. Richard Lyman. <laughs> Donald Ken Kennedy. and Gerhard Casper. These were the nine men who have led this university over its first 110 years. These are the nine presidents who transformed this small regional university of the West into what it is now, one of the finest universities in the land. Over the last 11 years, a new president has been at the helm. He has led us through good times and bad times, but always with a very firm hand on the tiller. John Hennessy stands on the shoulders of the presidents that have preceded him, but he's taken the university in a bit of a new direction. But before you fret, let me assure you that the university's mission is as it has always been since 1891, the dissemination of knowledge through teaching and learning, and the creation of knowledge through research. But underlying this mission is this foundational premise this foundational understanding that Stanford exists fundamentally to make the world a better place. And to paraphrase, to paraphrase the founders themselves, Stanford exists to benefit humanity and civilization. So 
So after spending 110 years building this phenomenal university, when John Hennessy took over, he said, let's unleash the power of this university, its faculty, its students, and yes, its alumni, and focus on creating knowledge that might help yield solutions to some of the most intractable problems facing our, our world. Once again, I think it's something that would make the Stanfords very proud. John Hennessy is a world-renowned computer scientist whose research has fundamentally changed the world of computing. But at the same time, he's a beloved teacher. He's an engineer with membership in some of the most prestigious national societies of academia, but at the same time a humanist who cares deeply about the human condition. He's an entrepreneur with a stunning Silicon Valley resume, but at the same time an academic deep in his heart. He's a native of the East Coast, Long Island, New York, to be specific, as is his wife, Andrea. Well, this, I think we should celebrate Andrea Hennessy. But notwithstanding his roots in the East, he's most definitely now a man of the West, who simply personifies that pioneering spirit, that ethos that is so popular in this part of the country. And he would be embarrassed if he knew I were telling you this, but he's back in a soundproof room right now. <laughs> he is the architect of the renaissance of Stanford football. <laughs> in fact, in fact, earlier this morning, I think I overheard him talking to football coach Dave Shaw, might I allow, might, might I allow alumnus football coach David Shaw, John was giving him some of his defensive schemas to take care of the fact that Delano Howell, our strong safety, has hurt his hand. John had some ideas on how we could really respond to that injury. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for the man who leads our beloved university into the future, Stanford's 10th president, John Hennessy. Thank you all. Thank you, Howard. I was actually talking to Jim Harbar. He asked for some tips for Sunday's game, so. <laughs> well, I, welcome back to the farm. We are so delighted that you're here for reunion weekend, and I hope you come away with the same sense of excitement and vibrance that exists in this institution, from our students to our faculty. Truly, our alumni exemplify the strength of the Stanford community. And whether you're here for your fifth or your 50th reunion, remember, as I tell the freshmen when they arrive every fall, you are a member of the Stanford family for life. I know how much you look forward to these reunions. Certainly, they provide a time to connect with old friends, to look back and see how far you've come and see how far the university has come. And we're delighted to have so many alumni here for this weekend. And I think uh, my first advice is take a walk around this campus and see how great it looks. It is the, one of our great recruiting secrets. We bring students out here. You know, we used to, when we did the student tours, we used to not take them anywhere near the science and engineering side of campus. <laughs> because you remember what it looked like. I remember it looked like that when I arrived here in 1977. We used to call it the industrial slum of Stanford. Now you walk over and they see the excitement, they see these great buildings, they see the Jensen Wong Engineering Center with open 24 hours for students with a 24-hour espresso machine, an important ingredient <laughs> for young people working at odd hours. Uh, and we take them down in the basement, which has a replica of the garage in which Hewlett and Packard started the first Silicon Valley company. <laughs> so. But that was an incredible time in our university, and those of you celebrating your 50th reunion probably remember it. Stanford was led by Wally Sterling and Fred Terman, the dynamic duo of higher education. They changed what universities were like. They took us from an interior focus to an exterior focus. They brought the medical school down here to the campus from San Francisco. They began the project that eventually became SLAC, and they focused on excellence. Terman's steeples of excellence really helped craft a great future for Stanford, and that was the beginning of a tremendous rise for this university. 
Today, that pioneering spirit extends to interdisciplinary research across the university. And in fact, you'll hear this morning a wonderful example of terrific work going on in brain research. And I'm sure we have more than a few hum bio majors here this weekend, don't we? We should have a few there. <laughs> hum bio was our pilot interdisciplinary major, the thing that led the way for many others. It's celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. Amazing change to the university. And I saw an undergraduate, Ryan Statz, class of 11, who graduated just recently, described it this way. It's a dating site for majors. I said, a dating site for majors? He says, yes, it matches you up with your best course of study. <laughs> But before I arrived, I had a chance to look over some of your comments and memories in your class books. And seeing the ways in which some things change and some things never change is truly remarkable. The class of 01 was my first class that graduated during my presidency, and I recall their enthusiasm and energy. They were a very social group. Campus parties were big, from the mausoleum party to the Viennese ball to the exotic erotic and full moon on the quad. And they dedicated an entire page in their class book to the most memorable dining opportunities outside of Stern and Wilbur. <laughs> At the top of the list, in and out, but closely followed by Pluto's. 20 years separates the class of 06 and the class of 86. But I was struck by some powerful similarities in their remarks. Among the top things the class of 06 wished they had done when they were undergraduates, they wished that they had played more, followed closely by the regret that they did not go to enough office hours. This is something I bring up every year with the freshmen, and they're still reluctant to do it this many years later. But compare that to the class of 86, who wished they had taken more risks, focused more on academics, and of course, the thing that everybody who doesn't do it wishes, that they had gone overseas. Whether you're five years or 25 years out, both classes were pretty clear about the importance of their Stanford friends and community. More than 40% of the class of 06 list their Stanford friendships and memories as having the greatest impact on them. And 90% of the class of 86 still keeps in touch And many say that making close friends was the most important thing about their Stanford experience. Last month, when I welcomed our newest members of the Stanford family, it was fitting to discover that the class of 61 had provided them some valuable advice with a 50-year perspective to boot. One alumnus wrote to our new undergraduates, the next four years will be the freest until you retire. That's probably true. They don't believe it, but it is true. <laughs> so treat that college catalog as the greatest imaginable gift list. Another said, enjoy every moment, learn everything you can, and hold your friends close. That enduring sense of community and connection runs through each generation of Stanford alumni. You and your relationships to each other are what makes Stanford strong. And it's deeply gratifying to see how much you value your time at Stanford, because that's our goal, to give our students the best possible educational experience and to send them out in the world armed with strong friendships and an excellent education so that they can take the Stanford spirit with them and use their talents to make a difference in the world. While each of you has your favorite memory from the farm, from one generation to the next, we've always aspired to be a great university dedicated to make a difference in people's lives. When Jane and Leland Stanford directed us to promote the public welfare by exercising an influence on behalf of humanity and civilization, they were thinking about the future of the university. Throughout Stanford's 120-year history, we've been dedicated to that, to doing fundamental research which makes the world better, and to produce graduates who will go on to become leaders in all our communities. Five years ago, when I welcomed you back to campus, our campus-wide multidisciplinary initiatives were just underway. The BioX program, established in 1999, had just moved to the Clark Center and was drawing faculty from across the university into a bold new experiment, an experiment that would end up having faculty from more than 20 different departments 
housed in a single building, working across academic disciplines together on important problems. And then we had just created the bioengineering department, the first joint department in the university, joint between the medical school and the engineering school. And the Woods Institute for the Environment had just been established in our new pre-court institute for energy efficiency, giving major boost to our initiative on environment and sustainability. And our international initiative had just awarded its first round of faculty research funds, funding such important research as governance under authoritarian rule and feeding the world in the 21st century. Well, a lot has happened since then. These research initiatives led us to take a bigger look, a bigger picture, and think about what role Stanford could play in taking on the great challenges we face in a global society. It led us to launch the Stanford Challenge, an ambitious campaign to support that work. And over the past five years, the response of alumni and friends has been truly extraordinary. More than 161,000 people have made a contribution to this campaign. 161,000. That's an incredible number. And of course, it's made a tremendous difference in the work we're able to do. While the campaign continues through the end of this year, I can guarantee it will far surpass its goals. But more importantly, it's allowed us to support the innovative multidisciplinary work being done by our faculty and students, and that makes a real difference. For example, we've been looking at how the body re regenerates itself and find ways to treat autoimmune diseases, such as diabetes or Alzheimer's, to treat cardiovascular disease and think about Parkinson's. Last year, we dedicated the Lori Loki Stem Cell Research Building on the School of Medicine campus. It is one of the largest facilities focused on stem cell research in the entire country. And we brought together faculty from across the medical school to work on these problems. And then we had a group of donors that gave us a wonderful Juhuli sculpture to put in the entryway. So if you want to go over and take a great walk and see a wonderful building and a beautiful piece of glass sculpture, I recommend it. Of course, other parts of our educational system have changed as well. Legal education has undergone a real renaissance, engaging in far more use of clinics as teaching opportunities for our students. And the new Newcomb building behind the law school has given us an opportunity to greatly expand our clinical activities. And now the Stanford Supreme Law, law Clinic is the most influential law clinic at any law school in the country. And international affairs is an increasing priority. We see it in the interest of Stanford that we help solve many of the key problems we face around the world. Through the Freeman Spogli Institute and the Woods Institute for the Environment, we've built a collaborative research effort to focus on the challenge of food security in the 21st century, an increasingly difficult problem as we fight challenges from environmental sustainability to issues of food security and quality. Stanford is taking a lead in this important problem, and it's one that is increasingly a threat. But we're also looking beyond the borders of the campus. Many of you know that we've been working on a project to build a center in Beijing, an overseas study center that will host not only our undergraduates, but also graduate students and faculty doing work in China. We will be the first university outside of China to be housed on a Chinese university campus. And we'll be there. <laughs> Through the Woods and the Precord Institute, we're working on important problems of environmental sustainability and energy, one of our key problems. One of our faculty members, Yi Shui, has invented a fascinating new battery structure, a battery that could make electric cars the number one choice for everybody and revolutionize our entire system and reduce our dependence on foreign oil. And one of our brilliant young researchers in civil engineering, Sarah Billington, has invented a new artificial replacement for wood, a durable, recyclable product made from bioplastics that has an incredible advantage. Once it's in the air, it's completely solid, but buried in a, in a landfill and not exposed to oxygen, it decomposes into its natural ingredients. Amazing. <laughs> and this... <laughs> 
And this creation proceeded in the wonderful way things happen at Stanford. It started with a little C grant and a proposal. This might work. The C grant led to a demonstration that the research could actually work. She got a bigger grant from the federal government outside the university, prototyped it, and today it's what? A Silicon Valley startup. <laughs> <laughs> but these are just a few of the challenges and the wonderful work going on in the university in the last few years. As you know, Stanford has never been an institution that's been content to stand still and just revel in its past accomplishments. It's been an institution that moves forward and takes bold steps. So when Mayor Bloomberg issued an invitation for the universities to consider setting up a campus in New York, we decided that Stanford should respond. We saw several possibilities. I think many of us in the technical and scientific fields believe that it was critical for the country to have another major center of innovation and technology leadership, and that that would be important to maintaining U.S. leadership in science and technology. We saw an opportunity to partner with New York City and its dynamic mayor to the benefit of Stanford and to the benefit of New York City. We saw an opportunity to offer our faculty and students another experience, one very different from the farm, but one that's incredibly valuable in its own right. We also saw an opportunity to allow growth of our graduate programs without impacting the use of the core campus. The farm can evolve, but we should never lose the sense of open space and that glorious design that Frederick Law Olmsted and the Stanfords gave us. We also felt that it was time for universities to understand how to operate with a distributed campus and to think about new technologies that would make that possible. Some of you may have seen an article in the New York Times a few weeks ago, above the fold actually, uh, that talked about a wonderful set of three courses offered by some of my colleagues in computer science. These three courses are being done online and they're open to registration to anybody in the world that wants to take them. And by the way, these are full courses, not just a set of lectures. There are exams and quizzes and homework assignments. Three courses, 180,000 people have registered for these courses. <laughs> That's right, I, I think we're changing the world and we're piloting how will education be delivered in the future. And there'll be combinations of ways, online, small classes and seminars, and we're looking, exploring, how education should shift and change over time to deliver the best possible experience we can for our students. Well, needless to say, as far as New York goes, we have some tough, tough competition ahead of us, uh, and our team has been working on a proposal. We've only had just over three months to complete this proposal, and our response is 600 pages long. So it is a monumental effort um, involving hundreds of people who've had to go explore this site. We do have a wonderful site, and what you should do is go online to the Stanford in New York webpage. If you Google Stanford New York City, you'll get there, and you'll see some beautiful um, designs that our architects have done for this wonderful location on Roosevelt Island. This is a truly unique opportunity to get 10 acres of land in New York City. Um, and really build a marvelous campus on it. So take a look and you'll see what we're thinking about and how those plans evolve over time. 20 years ago, when Stanford was celebrating its centennial, our commencement speaker was John Gardner, a beloved Stanford professor and trustee, founder of Common Cause, and secretary of health, education, and welfare under President Johnson. He gave some valuable advice to the members of the class of 1991, advice which I find incredibly relevant today. He talked about how our communities need us. They need our loyalty, our understanding, our support. And he singled out Stanford as distinctive as a community, a community that still needs its support. He said, and I quote, Leland and Jane Stanford's dreamed a remarkable dream. 
And what they created not only served the future, it helped shape that future. We are moving toward a future we can only dimly discern. Yet we must begin now to gather the knowledge, formulate the concepts, and design the institutions that will enable us to survive that future, and perhaps with luck, have some part in shaping it. In those tasks, no instruments will be more helpful than the research universities. And Stanford stands in the front rank. We must strengthen it, protect it, improve it, renew it, and help it move to new levels of greatness. End of quote. John Gardner was a great man, and he got it right. At Stanford, our researchers, our students, and our faculty take that charge seriously, just as I know you do. And as many of you have noted, the very best thing about Stanford is its people. You are the great strength of the Stanford community. Your service and your support are critical to our continued success. Over the years, you've played vital roles as the university has grown and developed. But most importantly, I know, as I've traveled around the country and seen many of you at Leading Matters, that you share our belief that the work going on at Stanford is critical to our future. So, before I close, I want to ask two small requests from you. First, have a great weekend and make the most of it. Second, as you know, on Saturday, the university with the longest winning streak in college football and the only quarterback in the top 50 who's an engineering major, <laughs> and decided to finish his degree rather than entering the draft. <laughs> So we'll be playing the University of Washington. Now, if you've ever gone to a game in Husky Stadium, you know that it is loud. That's where we need your help tomorrow <laughs> to make sure that the team knows that we're behind them and we support them. So we'll get out there and cheer the Cardinal. Thank you for everything you do for this great university, and have a terrific weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And, and now I have, the, I have the honor to introduce uh, the chair of our wonderful panel that you're going to hear from this morning. Um, Carla Schatz is a Stanford person who spent time here and then made the fateful decision to go to the Stanford of the East. <laughs> but we kept our eye on her, and a few years ago, we were absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to bring Carla back to Stanford to lead the BioX program as our director. She is a professor of biology and neurobiology and a distinguished scientist and a great leader. Let me introduce Carla and her panel.